late as the early 20th century, it was still commonplace for leading scientists to proclaim that we humans would never be able to exhaust the bounty of the Earth. A hundred years later, it is now commonplace for people to declare that we are on the brink of destroying our planet. Such a shift in our way of seeing things cannot help but be tremendously jarring, emotionally, psychologically and spiritually. The idea that our world could be falling apart is not the sort of thing that one can carry with ease, and many folks who grapple with such an idea can end up becoming numb with grief. Indeed, I know many young people who are essentially heartbroken at the perceived state of things, and who consequently feel the weight of the world on their shoulders. I have known this feeling from the inside. In my early twenties, I was captivated with the question of possible environmental catastrophe. I handed out how to vote cards for the Greens, which I cringe about now, and I spent two years working on a 600 page manuscript for a book on how to spiritually handle the possibility of the end of the world, which I'm relieved I never finished nor published. Suffice to say, I was not simply a casual observer. But I was never fully at home in this worldview. I suspect my burgeoning Christian faith helped prevent me from sliding into the more anti human strains of environmentalism. Even then, it was becoming commonplace for people to speak of human beings as a cancer on the planet who do nothing but spread and destroy until nothing is left. Couples who dared to have more than one or two children, or in some cases any children at all, risked being castigated as greedy, reckless, or worse. I eventually decided that such a worldview was just too soul-destroying for me to embrace. I could see it warping people's humanity and leading to depression. I didn't know if we were irreparably harming our planet, but I knew that driving ourselves crazy over it wasn't going to help anyone. Furthermore, the simple fact of time passing and various doomsday predictions not coming to pass has a way of fostering a degree of suspicion regarding the breathless pessimism that is so common today. Part of the problem in all this is that the scientific data involved is both highly specialized and highly politicized. Many people only hear about it through their respective echo chambers, with some declaring that the end is nigh with a religious fervor that would put most Christians to shame, and others declaring that it's all left-wing lunacy. In such a setting, seeking out reliable facts is mildly daunting. For what it's worth, here's my best attempt at some clarity. While the Earth's climate has always fluctuated, there is solid consensus that recent years have seen global warming taking place at a significant rate and that human influence is almost definitely a factor in this. That said, a number of unanswered questions would seem to remain regarding the nature and extent of human influence, which itself raises questions about what ought to be done in response. Species loss is real and looks set to continue for the foreseeable future, though the projections vary greatly. In terms of us humans, the spectre of overpopulation would now seem rather overstated, with many projections envisioning that we will plateau at around 9 to 10 billion people in the coming century before beginning a decline. Meanwhile, the widespread belief that the world is falling apart and the self-loathing, depression and frankly suicidal tendencies that flow from this is decidedly unhelpful. The arrogance of the present moment is an ever-present temptation, but it's important to note that ours is not a uniquely troubled time. Most people who have ever lived on this planet have lived lives that were poor and brutish and short. This world has always been a mess, marked as it is with the sign of the cross, and we should not be shocked that our time is no different. Life is harsh, people are both stubborn and resilient, and God is patient. Perhaps some of you will think that this is irresponsible of me, that we're in a crisis and time is of the essence, and talk like mine isn't helping things. Well. I've been where you are, and with the benefit of hindsight, I can see that in my urgency to fix things, I was often only making them worse. Part of the reason why I'm a priest and not a politician is that while the world will always rush with urgency between the various economic, social and political issues of the day, I'm convinced that the real factors underlying many of these questions are essentially spiritual in nature. How much of the unbridled consumption of our times, for instance, is fed by the misguided yearning of people striving to fill the deeper longings of the soul and, like an addict, craving more and more of what isn't working. 
trying to stave off annihilation with a self-loathing approach is ultimately self-defeating. Preserving life first requires the ability to appreciate life, which again is a decidedly spiritual question. To bring children into this world is fundamentally an act of hope, and hope is ultimately a supernatural virtue. It is not primarily about having favourable circumstances, but for us Christians, it is grounded in faith. Faith that the risen Lord, who transformed the crucifixion and overcame the grave, can also produce life and light from the mess of our lives and our times. Now, we Christians are certainly called to care for God's creation, as has been emphasised by recent popes. And we are always called to ongoing conversion, which invariably has implications for our behaviour. In this regard, a concrete step that we can each take, particularly those of us in a wealthy country like Australia, is to seriously examine our own personal patterns of consumption and waste, both as a question of justice, if we feel entitled to a level of material wealth not realistically shareable by all, and in terms of the numbing effect that too much material comfort can have on the soul. As G.K. Chesterton once said, there are two ways to have enough. One is to accumulate more and more, the other is to desire less. And as so many of the saints have reminded us, the key here is to focus our desires not on the things of this world, but on the source of everything that is good, on God himself. With all of this, I would recommend keeping an open mind. Regard doomsday preachers of any type with a degree of suspicion. And if discussion around this stuff is driving you crazy, take a step back. However things may play out, we Christians have always known that this is a passing world, and our task remains the same. Love God and love our neighbour. God ultimately desires our sanctification, and in this life, that means the cross. But with the eyes of faith, we can have the confidence of knowing that God is ultimately in control and therefore that all things work for the good of those who love him. And so it just may be that in an increasingly self-loathing age, our primary contribution as people of faith is to be a beacon of light and life, witnessing to the supernatural peace of the one who makes life worth living. Well, thanks so much for watching, and until next time, be a saint.